I've always wondered to myself, is there something that helps the entrepreneurs that succeed that they have which other entrepreneurs don't? Is it something they know? Is it how they run their businesses? Is it the people they hire? Is it where they went to school? Is it their socialization, their background, their education, their mental spaces? What is it that makes the entrepreneur succeed? Welcome to my masterclasses where I share with you everything you need to know about how to become a high growth, high scale entrepreneur. I'm joined by guests. We break down the myths, the ideas, the lengths, the legends, everything you need to know to become a high growth entrepreneur. Warning, this is the High Performance Zone. The most important thing you can be if you're an entrepreneur is you need to be ruthlessly paranoid. Yeah. Yeah. Ruthlessly. Guys, I will tell you right now, every single person who comes into my game, Gabaz, even the ones who think I don't know, I know. And the thing about, the thing about being number one is you got to be careful. Because you know, nobody pays attention until you're the champ. Yeah. When you're the champ, you become the blueprint, the template which means everything you do, everybody copies. Yes, yes. And they copy only to, to beat you. Yes. So, you gotta be, so, so now the game changes. You've got to be very tactical. There's some stuff I'd, I'd love to tell people, but I can't tell them because that's my competitive advantage. And, and they can't know that that's the thing I'm doing, but I'm doing it. Make sense? So the, so the game plan changes, and, and you have to stay ruthlessly, but I mean ruthlessly paranoid. I'm a, I'll, I'll take your question in a moment, but... So I've won the World Championship in public speaking twice, right? But I always have a nightmare that wakes me up in cold sweats, that there's a kid somewhere in Umbu. <laughs> and this little <laughs> is about to come and take me out. Yeah? He's probably not even born yet. Or if he is, he goes to a township school somewhere. You understand? And that for me, that's how I keep my, just all the time, keep, keep your finger on the pulse. Know what's happening, who's doing what, what's happening, what's moving, what's changing, what's shifting. You need to know everything about your game. Everything about your game. Because it's the punch you don't see coming that takes you out. Yes, sir. How do you manage being paranoid, as you said, but also then also <coughs> still staying open to the opportunities that come? Because I almost understand that paranoid to make you very stagnant and not why is too worried about what other people are doing and not worried about your own growth. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. How do you manage that? You, you know, so uh, l let me make the recommendation first. There's a guy called Andrew Grove who wrote a book. Um, I think it's, it's not called Constructive Paranoia. It's, I've actually got it in my office. Um, it's one of my favorite business books in the world. Andrew Grove ran uh, IBM. And he took over IBM in the 80s. Now, for those of you who don't know the, the economic history, Japan was the second largest economy in the world to, to the US, right? And what, what the Japanese got really good at is kind of what the Chinese then became really good at, which was uh, manufacturing arbitrage, that they moved productive capacity from the US to Japan. And one of the things they did was they moved the production of silicosis and silicon. The reason Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley was because the first place where the silicon was made that went into computer chips was in Palo Alto, which is why it's called Silicon Valley. That's why I laugh when people go Silicon Cape and I go, but there was no silicon. Yeah. <laughs> you know us, copy paste. Anyway, so, so, so anyway, so Andrew Grove takes over IBM and at the time, the Japanese manufacturers who were manufacturing computer chips were doing so at a 30% the cost of the US manufacturers. And he's the largest chip manufacturer, by the way. So every piece of computer hardware, um, digital hardware, runs on a computer chip. The phone you have, the, now the car you're driving, everything has a chip in it, right? But these guys, the Japanese, were making, when you're manufacturing it at a 30% the unit cost. If he's doing it for a dollar, they're doing it for 30 cents. It's just no way to compete. And, and in the book, I don't want to spoil it for you, go get the book. But in the book, he talks about how he flipped the script on them. And he talks about this very important power of constructive paranoia. So the thing about constructive paranoia is paranoia, if you're not careful, will destroy you. Yeah, to your point, it'll be destructive, right? But what you've got to learn is you've got to learn how to use the constructive paranoia 
to fuel innovation internally. Simply said, you've got to, rather than focus on who's doing what, you almost got to open the window and take a peek. And they go, oh, okay. And then go back in and say, guys, this is what's happening. We need to innovate. We need to think differently. Yeah. That's the difference between just being paranoid and being constructively paranoid. It's a dipstick. You know, so you don't have to worry about it every day. You know, it's not, no, I don't wake up every day and go, ooh, you know. But once in a while, I take a peek. You know, I go, oh, who's the new kid? Oh, there's a new kid. Who's this guy? Oh, uh, so-and-so. And what does he talk about? Oh, okay. What's his background? Oh, okay. And my, my team will tell you. We'll do full research. I'll know everything about you, man. I'll do full research about you. What school you went to, what university you went to, what you studied, what business you had, if it failed, how you got into speaking, da da da, da. I know everything about you. And I go, okay, cool. Next. <laughs> um, last note, just on this. Do you guys know that the difference between the Earth's surface and the outer layer of our atmosphere is 16 kilometers? Did you know that? Yeah, there's a reason that's important. It's because over millions of years, all life that has sustained itself on Earth has existed in a space of 16 kilometers. In the length and depth that is the universe, you just need 16 kilometers. It's more important what happens inside than what's happening outside, is what I'm saying. I lost them. <laughs> you know, so, so when, when, and I say this to a lot of, a lot of, a lot of friends of mine who are CEOs of companies, massive companies that are being disrupted by small players, and they go, the disruption's happening, I go, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You, 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 we as human beings wouldn't live if we worried one day that the asteroid is gonna strike the Earth. But today, none of you have thought about it because you almost take it that that will take care of itself. You've gotta focus on what you're doing here. So too is what happens when you are constructively paranoid. It's that 16 kilometers, man. The space between the Earth's surface and the outer layer of our atmosphere. All life, bacteria, viruses, the evolution of time, religion, story, narrative, languages, tribes, civilizations, spaces, innovation, technology, all of it for millions of years. 16 kilometers, comrade. Ash! Yeah, man! <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Let me start with the chap at the back, yes sir. So I'll work with the seat on a project called separation and stuff. Yeah. What we do is that we go pretty much house to house. Uh like an official awareness of what we want to people how to separate things. Okay. Sure. So uh, the problem now is that uh, I think it's, it's more of a behavioral issue because there's people that do, uh, as I say, as they say, the people that, that do what I do, but they do it in center, they get better results, they even get paid by the households to do it. Got you. So, what can I say when I get to the household, they be like, Manji, Mangi, Mangi is a little bit of a toilet. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the reason we're doing it is because. Uh, uh, Johannes Gatalo uh, creates like three million uh, tons of waste uh, uh, annually. And uh, our rentals are full. And in no time, uh, we pretty much have been in another space of rentals. So we go to divert the, 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 the amount of waste that are that gets into the level. So, how do you build a model around um, changing behavior yeah. in, in terms of? Um, um, telling a person uh, that this works for you because of the, 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 the general pictures that this climate change and uh, all landfills are within a certain like I think 20, 20 kilometer radius of Soweto. Sure. All landfills in that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, who here watched the Elko, do Elko documentary on climate change? Yeah, there's your problem. You're solving a problem that is not immediate for the people for whom you're solving it. So, so the pain point isn't strong enough to substantiate a business model. Remember, the very basis of every business is a single question. It doesn't matter the business you're in, but the very basis of every business is, this, is a single question. In fact, anybody who's ever met me with me will tell you this is the first question I ask. <coughs> What problem are you solving? Okay? So you've kind of answered that for your business. Where it gets tricky is the second question, which is, <coughs> is 
is there money in the problem? See, even if I solve a problem, as long as that problem is not a pain point material enough for the market I'm solving it for, then what I'm doing is I'm, ticking my, I'm, I'm tickling myself. In, in academic terms, it's called intellectual masturbation. <laughs> no, 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 it's, that's actually a term. An intellectual masturbation is when professors meet to talk about things that mean fuck all. But for them, <laughs> do you know what I'm trying to say? Because the thing they talk, it's their thing. You know, if you ever, it's like if you ever see tech people, mechanics, you know, they talk about that. You're like, what are you talking about? Anyone who's into like a niche, people who are into cigars, into wines, they can have a five hour conversation. And you're like, look, it's white. It's red. <laughs> this is it. Make sense? So, so, so I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I'm thinking that there is not a lot of this in the problem you're solving based on the people for whom you're solving the problem. Yeah? So one part is, if a person, remember, change is a premium, right? Uh, let, me take, let me take a step back. So human beings are driven by habit. And the reason human beings are driven by habit, uh, people who study the brain tell us, they did both cognitive uh, psychology studies, but also actually neuroscientists have proven to us that the brain is the most efficient mechanism in the human body. The reason the brain has to be is because were it not for the brain, we wouldn't have survived living in the caves. So the reason human beings have outlived other species is because the brain adapts. You come home and there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a stove on and the stove has a red ring on it. Your brain knows not to touch that stove. It's hot. But you haven't touched it yet. You haven't even felt the heat. So what's happened over years is there's been an evolutionary process where your brain has understood danger without you having to interact with it. You know, it's a, uh, I get like this with German Shepherds. <laughs> yeah, well, just watch too much Sarafina and I'm like, eh, eh, eh. You ever, you ever visit white people and they even give their dogs human names, eh? Say hello to Todd. You go, for tag, Todd. Oh, oh. Ma say hello. Take Todd outside, man. You know what? <laughs> it's, 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 it's your, your brain has learned how to survive. It's learned how to adapt. But to do this, the brain forms habits. This is why you drive on the right-hand side of the car on the left-hand side of the road. It's for your own survival. Right? You sit on the, right, the left-hand side of the car, there's no steering wheel. If you drove on the right-hand side of the road, you're going to go into oncoming traffic. So without you even thinking about it, your brain automatically adjusts. If I behave this way, I'm fine. Your brain does this all the time. Anybody who's ever been in a romantic relationship where someone broke your heart, if you date a person, who does the thing the other person did, you go, ah, wabba, 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 wabba. Yeah? <laughs> you don't even wait for the, for, for we are joy on night night. You don't wait. You don't need the episode. You're like, I have seen this script before. Because, you know, Deepak Chopra calls it electric fences. Uh, fascinating. But he says, if you, if you touch an electric fence and it hits you, the next time you walk past one, all you need to hear is <laughs> and your body physically feels the pain as if you've just touched it. It's exactly the same thing, right? So this thing about habits, guys, is actually very powerful because a lot of us form the wrong habits. And to unform it, man, man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Try this. Try wake up every single morning for 4.30 if you've never done it. That first week is hell because you're not going into your brain and you're trying to recode it. And that's, that's not how your brain is wired. Your, your brain has formed certain habits to survive the world it's in, right? So the people you're working with have a certain habit written by a certain script. The way you've explained it, and I don't want to be presumptuous, is the habit is if I change behavior, I must be paid. Which is why they're saying, if I do this, but you're saying, if you do this, there's a better planet. And the person is saying, but I don't care. <laughs> because this is not a problem that's important for me. Make sense? 
And, and this is, you know, this is the, it's the problem we spoke about, right? So it's the, it's, you know, it's the classic pyramid problem. This is base of pyramid, middle class, uber elite and rich. Yeah? If you use logic, maybe I should make this, make this bigger. Um, so there's a lot of marketing research on this. You know, the whole pyramid model, now they've actually proven that there's like five layers to the pyramid because there's an ultra lower base, different story. But the people who live at the base of pyramid have a set of competing interests and values. Yeah, you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you could probably overlay it onto this. But the people at the base of the pyramid have a certain series of priorities. If the problem you're solving is not a priority, there's no, there's no, they're not going to do it. It's, just, it's not going to happen. It's a, so, then the last thing I want to say to you. Somebody said this to me, actually. I was, I was, who was it? It was Damien, a friend of mine. We did our MBA together. Australian now lives in London. So, we did our MBA together in the UK. And Damien said something to me, blew, blew my mind away. I'm telling him about this problem. I'm like, Damien, this, this. He says, oh, mate. Oh, you're making a classical error there, mate. Oh, mate. I said, what's the classical error? He says, oh, you're assuming that the reason you're fixing the problem is the reason people want to buy. Wait, say that again? <laughs> the reason you're doing something is not the reason the person pays you to do the thing you're doing. <laughs> A soccer player plays soccer because he loves it. We watch because we want to see him score. A fighter gets in the cage because he loves it. We watch because we want to see somebody bleed. <laughs> Lewis Hamilton gets in that car because he genuinely loves Formula One driving. We watch because we love competition and rivalry. Yeah? If it wasn't Lewis Hamilton, we'd be into somebody else. So you always got to remember as an entrepreneur, when you fix a problem, you got to ask yourself, the reason I'm doing this, is it the reason that they're going to buy? The reason that's important is because your entire communication strategy is built on it. That's <laughs> comrades. Right, right. I just want to go back. I just want to go back. You remember this? When I said first time entrepreneurs focus on the product, that's what I meant. Yeah? So the first time entrepreneur goes, I have made these pens. These pens are made from ecologically friendly plastic. What is that? I'm not sure. But the brochure from the company in Finland that makes them said it's ecologically friendly plastic. They use a water base, which means that you can remove the ink. They leave no trail of themselves in the world. These pens are fantastic. And then the person sitting in a government department says, so, Kostiana? <laughs> so you went and designed your whole website and your page about, was about how amazing this pen is. The first thing the guy goes is cost. The reason you sell is not the reason they buy. So you got to get close to your customer. I would suggest some sort of survey, some sort of study. You've got to get close to the customer and you've got to ask them, why do you do what you do? You know, the guys at Batu came to see me was uh, last year, the two of them, because they gave me a pair, right? And telling me about this amazing story of Batu. And I was like, guys, you guys are sitting on a damn gold mine. Like, if I was running Batu, shit. I mean, they're doing well now. If I was running it, god damn. I'll tell you why. Because I was like, Batu Joe has been there as a symbol of progress and as a symbol of saying to the establishment by our people for years. Because even when they told us we couldn't go to their places, we went to Stogipat. Yeah? Even when they kept us in low paying jobs, we went to Stogipat. It ain't just a shoe. It's a symbol not only of where I come from, but what I aspire to, because I don't put a shoe on unless I'm going somewhere. God damn, that's a marketing campaign. You get it? So, 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 you know, so the story for them might be, yeah, but it's made of mesh, it's breathing, <laughs> breathing, cheap. This thing, this thing, when I put it on, when's halal? You understand? So you got, you got to be, you got to be like, you got to be connected to the pulse of where your people are. And you, then you got to make sure your story connects with what your people are going through. Yeah? <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. You guys getting value? Yeah. Are we good? Uh, sorry, I just want to, I was, I was making a note about this. Oh, 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 uh, yeah, I want to I get to this. So you're writing a story, right? I want you to imagine like you're selling your business, you're designing a website, a front page, whatever. There's like a, there's like a four stage process you got to go through. I want to share it with you guys very quickly because it kind of connects to what you're doing, right? 
So uh, the guys at Missing Link actually do this amazing company. They're the largest presentation design company in South Africa, so I can't take the credit. Rich Mulholland and his team did this stuff. They're really good at it. But they have a, a process that they follow from source right through to the end page where they go, anytime you're designing a story that you're telling people, kind of try and follow this process. I've doctored it myself with my own thinking, but the, the methodology is kind of the same, right? So it goes something like this. So first, you got to ask yourself, uh, anytime you're creating a value proposition and you want to communicate it to people, you have to make clear to the person with whom you're communicating what is the problem. There's a reason that's the beginning point. It's kind of like watching a movie. If in the first seven minutes of the movie, you don't establish the good guy from the bad guy, you lose interest. Yeah. So, so even though I might watch a movie, Avengers Endgame, for three hours, yeah, in that first seven minutes, they have to establish the plot. Otherwise, I'm, I'm emotionally not invested for the rest of the movie. You lose me. Uh, the old cats who used to make action movies, Chuck Norris, Van Damme. <laughs> you can tell my generation, it's not Van Damme. Van Damme. <laughs> Van Damme. I want Polo. I want Polo. Yeah. <laughs> Those cats were really good at this because what they did was in that first seven minutes, they showed the bad guy beating a good guy. So in the immediately, you're, you're like, I want the good guy to win. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone took it to the next level. He didn't just show them the bad guy beating the good guy. He opened... Hey? Rambo. Rambo. Nazo. <laughs> Nazo. Yeah? <laughs> hey, it's my show here, man. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rambo, you know, because because what he did in the Rocky movies, right, is he would start the movie that and tan, 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 you'd hear the whole thing, then he would show himself being a good guy, minding his own business, and then Mr. T would come and fetch him. You know, like how people do on Twitter, they fetch you. I want to you, we and she, who's man, and who's man, who's man, who's me, me, we are land. Anyway, <laughs> people say to me, how come you never reply to the fetches on Twitter? Because I get to do it in my master classes. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, so, so what would happen is the person would come to him and he would be beaten, right? Dolph Lundgren killed Apollo Creed. Mr. T beat Rambo. On the second uh, uh, Rambo, Apollo Creed, on the first one, Apollo Creed beat him. You get it? The bad guy always beats the good guy. Then he shows himself go through a process of transformation. He goes somewhere to train. Yeah? yeah? And then they show how good the bad guy is, how good he's training. The whole time they're just building up your emotion. Yeah. Which means you have to amplify why this problem is urgent. That's where you're having a disconnect. The person's going, I ah, changed behavior. Lento le, umklabu yo pela next year. Angna mali namklanje. That's why he's saying, if I do this, umpatala nini, manje. Umklabu pela next year. Let Trump worry about umklabu pela. So you got you got to amplify the problem and you got to make the problem urgent. Now, fix it now. Because urgent means action, and what you want at the end of every single engagement is action. I want you to do something, subscribe, follow a page, buy something, but something's got to happen at the end of the engagement. You know, otherwise we just had a Stockfeld meeting. So the first question you've got to ask yourself is what's the problem that you're solving? Yeah? Then the second thing you've got to do, Nancy, Nancy Duarte talks about us and them, us and them, us and them, is you've got to show the person what is the cost of not solving the problem. And you gotta make that cost proper. Yep. Like, look, this is the problem, and it's huge. Now, if you do nothing about it, this is what's gonna happen. Yeah? Then the second thing you gotta show them is why, this is where a lot of entrepreneurs get it wrong. Why are you the best person, read person, company, to solve the problem. Yeah, you're digging this? Yeah. yeah, it's cool, right? Like, why are you the best person? Okay, so I get the problem, yeah? I get it's urgent, cool. Okay, I get that if I don't fix it, this is gonna happen. Okay, why you? 
Because you live in a sea of competitors, right? Why would I come to you? Why am I not talking to Tonello at the back or Mark there? Or why you? This is all about one word, my friend. Credibility. Absent of it, no one's listening. Do you know how you know when you have credibility? You know how you know? When people start using your profile to build theirs. That's why when they fetch me, I don't reply. I'm at the peak of the mountain. You want to come for me? Climb the f*** up. Because I'm not coming down. You understand? Like, I spent 20 years building my name. Didn't just happen. 20 years to build a name and a reputation. 20 f***ing years. Talizolo, zong papel. No, no, no. Do your 20 years first, chief. But then we can engage. Once you've been through life, we can engage. You don't have to show up to every fight you're invited to. You understand? Credibility, man. Guys, this is huge. Huge, huge, huge. Those of you on social media, your credibility is attached to this, eh? Because a lot of you are... Um, Maybe I should, should I share this? Yeah, I'll share this with you guys. So my social media feed is set for US, not here. Which is why I don't know if you've noticed, but over the past three months, I've not commented on anything that's trending. I don't have the benefits of doing that anymore. My company employs people. I work in capital markets. I'm a board member at Safka. We're raising a financial services license and I'm raising a two billion rand fund. I can't be commenting on stupid things. <laughs> Make sense? So, and I see a lot of people get caught in this. There's a hot issue now. Now you are all there. Hey, 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 hey. Guys, people are watching, eh? Hey, I'm going to tell you guys. I have this trick, this, this test. I call it the Darren and Ricebi test. Darren is a friend of mine. He used to be the sales director of, uh, in fact, he was the MD of a company called Software AG here. Then he became global COO of SAP, global COO, reporting directly to Bill. And now he's the CEO of a company listed on the NASDAQ called FIS. Darren and I have known each other for, I've been a professional speaker 15 years, we've known each other for 14 years. In that time, Darren has probably spent 20 million rand with me. Darren and I mates. When I'm in London, I'm at his house, he buys a McLaren, he invites me, I drive it. When he's here, you know, we're like, we're mates. I've got the kind of relationship with Darren, price doesn't matter. Darren will tell his team, he'll go, guys, I'm doing a conference in the Bahamas, get Vusi to close it. They'll go, ah, Vusi costs $40,000. I don't care, get Vusi. Get it? Then Raisibi works up the road here. She's the CFO of uh, NetBank. Amazing lady, guys. The coolest, most humble soul you'll ever meet. Like, Raisibi is my role model on the real. And a week ago, she just won an award from the investment analysts, right? In a year where they were implementing IFRS 9 in banking, she also got a, a, a reward for the best, the best relationship with analysts in terms of reporting, which is huge. Because when you're a listed company, you have to report everything you do. Darren is on Twitter. He has 2,000 followers. Yeah? He spent over 20 million rand with me. Raisib is on Twitter under a fake name with 300 followers. She's given me over half a bar. We are land on it now. We are so good. Angmas! You see, you're starting fight with a Zulu. I don't know this guy. I'm here minding my own business. He says something, I answer. Darren and Rasibi both follow me. You know what's just happened? Now they know who he is. And the fact that I've replied means I have made credible what he's saying. I ain't got the time, man. I literally ain't got the time. <laughs> There's 24 hours in a day and I'm not giving you a cent of it. Yeah. Go with your verified account. <laughs> but there's an entire ecosystem of people here who are worried about the problem I'm solving and about supporting me, who have the means and capital, who I'm not going to make a part of your pathetic exchange. That's why you've got to be careful of the conversation you're involved in online. You might be passionate about it, you just don't need to be available to that conversation all the time. Make sense? Right, uh, so, so, just to recap, what is the problem? Make the problem urgent. 
what is the cost of not solving that problem? What are you, why are you the best person to solve that problem? Guys, it's about credibility. So this is qualifications, accreditations, any of that stuff. You've got to make clear why you're the best person to solve that problem. A lot of people do it in their about page on the website. I put it on home. Home is where I got to know all about you, man. When I land on your website, that's where I've got to find out. That's why the conversation about social media is important. Because guess what? When I follow your social media feed, you've got to be communicating the thing that's connected to the problem that shows me why you're the expert. So rather than tell me what was trending, you should be telling me about the thing you're doing and why you're the best person to do it. Because you don't know where I'm finding you. Maybe I'm following your social media. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I heard you on a radio and I decided rather than go to your website, I'm going to go to your social media feed. Make sense? Yeah? So you've got to go through all of this. All of this. And then at the end, you have to give the person the so what. And this is, what is the action I want you to take? A lot of us, have, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs, unless you've been in sales, hands up here, anyone who's worked in sales, yeah? If you worked in sales, you know, right? Like, if you're not closing the deal at the end of it, like, that's it. You, you, you know, so salespeople, naturally, naturally, they start a conversation with this thing in mind. Yeah, um, <laughs> well? Then I don't ask for your numbers. It's called flattery. Yeah? If I ask for your numbers at the end, it's called ukshel. Yeah? So, so at the end of it, there's got to be an action item. Go, go to the My Growth Fund website. We've got three action points. Literally, as you're reading past the website, it says, if you're interested in this, click here. I'm not just writing it for you to read. There's an action I want you to take. When you're involved in the conversation with a customer, potential client, there must be a so what. Okay, so we've met. I've told you about this. At the end of this meeting, these are the things I'm hoping are going to come out of it. I need X, Y, and Z. Can you do X, Y, and Z for me? And you've got to get the person to commit in the meeting. Get them to commit in the meeting. Just a, just a thought, guys. How many of you here who are involved in terms of selling your own sales or your own business have to take sales meetings with client? Yeah? Okay. So to you guys especially, sometimes you have to have more than one meeting to sell. Never leave the first meeting until the second meeting is confirmed. We just met. You just gave me a proposal, right? And you're saying to me, take this proposal and read it. While we're in the meeting, you've got to say, I'm available to be back in the next two weeks. How does your diary look? It's a bit like going to a doctor with an infection. He doesn't let you leave until he's booked the next appointment. Make sense? You, this thing is critical. Without action, nothing changes. You just, you're going to have meetings, 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 meetings. <laughs> <laughs>